Praise God. So glad for all of you that could be with us, uh, joining us live streaming this morning. Welcome, welcome to Glory Point. Um, so I, we have a message today, but um, normally we don't kind of, um, uh, well, let me just, let me do it this way. Um, this week, Marilyn Anderson, uh, we were talking and brought to my attention, she asked me, what my response was to what Creflo Dollar had been saying this past week. And I said, I don't know, what has he been saying? And so he had released a statement or messages concerning tithing that seemed a little bit contrary to what we've known to be the word of God. So first of all, um, I, I didn't, I couldn't tell her because I, I don't know what he was saying. So I said I would check into it and then I'll get back to her. And then as I heard what he was saying, then I talked to Apostle Leon, and I also talked to Bishop down in Florida to confirm what I was feeling was the truth. Because to me, I feel that tithing is, co is covenant. And he's saying that tithing is not in the New Testament. And then I'm perplexed. I'm like, where is this coming from? You know, um, because I've always respected Dr. Truffle Dollar. I've always had high regard, always respected his teaching. And there's a scripture that really puts the fear of God in me. And, and I'm concerned with him about this, is that <coughs> teachers are held to a higher level of judgment, so to speak, for what we're teaching and how we're influencing people. Okay? So that, um, as a teacher and a pastor, that really concerns me. Like, I do not want to be misrepresenting anything that God is saying, or not saying, I should say. So for me, I love that we are a church under, under a covering of Apostle Leon and Bishop Hammond, the founder of Christian International, that when things come up, we have somebody under authority that we can go to, somebody that's been out there a bishop has been out there for 68 years teaching and studying doctrine and, and the whole history of the church. He's quite the theologian on the history of the church and the moves of God. And um, in case you're curious, this coming Friday, he will be 88 years old. So, yes, we got to, I got to wish him an early happy birthday, so, so that was fun. Um, so what I want to talk about, I mean, Cruffalo Dollar went to such extreme to say, throw away my books and tapes and everything you have on my teaching on tithing. Okay, so um, I believe that some of these statements are going to be out there and we need to talk about them and we need to know what God's truth is. Okay, Amen. and it's not just, hey, I'm saying this isn't right or this is wrong and believe me. No, we're going to go to the source, to the scriptures. And this is what I was discussing with Bishop and with Apostle Leon, is what is our foundational belief on tithing? Now, how Cruffle Dollar got a different interpretation, he says he had not been confronted with the gospel of grace. But, you know, I think in the last few years, even Cheryl was taught, there's been some issues with the gospel of grace that have gone to an extreme that, like, part of it, I think I remember that it's like, go ahead and sin, just say you're sorry and repent afterwards and you're still okay. Well, we don't, we don't believe that because the scriptures say that we have the grace to overcome the power of sin. Grace is not the permission to sin and then repent. We, we don't go out and intentionally sin saying, okay, now I'll plead the blood of Jesus and ask for forgiveness. So, so anyways, what I want to talk with you about is I want to share a few of the statements, just like three of them. I'm not trying to do exhaustive on every point and counterpoint, but I want to give you some of the basic frame of a few statements that he is saying that um, are concerning to me that we need to make sure we understand what the Word of God is saying. And then I'm going to share with you from 
my view and the conversations with Bishop, but that 40 minutes Bishop and I talked, so that was really great. And then also at length with Apostle Leon. So one of the first statements that that um, that he says is the New Testament, and this is from an article on the internet. There's a few of them out there. The New Testament, according to Crawford Dollar, says Christians no longer live under the requirements of the Mosaic Law. And this was spoken in regard to tithing. He also added he's not suggesting that we should water down our giving, but that the Mosaic Law is part of the Old Testament. So the response to this, and even Bishop said, he Bishop pointed out that tithing is not part of the Mosaic Law to begin with. It never was. It was never part of the, the law. Tithing began with Abraham in Genesis 14. And just incidentally, first fruits began in Genesis 4. Those are right after the story of creation, okay? Very early on in the Word of God. Moses, of course, came later, right? So Abraham gave it to the tenth, or the tithe. The tithe means a tenth. In faith, being in covenant with God, okay? And this is what stuck out to me. I tithe because I'm in covenant with God, not because anybody is making me, okay? Um, I give it in thanks and gratitude to him. Amen. God asked for the 10%. So we give it trusting him. If somebody is not in trust that God is going, that you're in covenant with God, take care, you're not going to give the 10%. <laughs> okay? It's, it's all about trust and partnership and being in that covenant. So the word of God, um, the bishop, he, he talks really fast. So he just wanted, he was talking about how we are Abraham's seed. We're supposed to be walking like Abraham. Uh, believing like Abraham. We're heirs of Abraham. We follow him, we walk in his steps, and we receive the promises of Abraham. So we need to do what Abraham did. Abraham showed us how to be in covenant with God. The Old Testament is a picture of a covenant people trying to walk in covenant with God, God's chosen people. It's all learning. The, the entire Bible is for our learning. Right? So, part of being in covenant with God, like Abraham was, is giving the tithe as Father Abraham, uh, as the father of our faith did. So, you see, tithing was never under the law. It's not a law, it's actually a principle that was revealed in the Old Testament about being in covenant with the Most High God. Amen? Amen. You know, um, there's a benefit to not being the oldest child. You know, Israel was God's oldest child. They're the ones who got to watch and see their, the benefits and the pitfalls of their relationship with God and were to be able to learn from that. So, so this principle, Bishop was emphasizing, tithing is a principle about being in covenant but this principle is never negated in the Old Testament, okay? Have you noticed, some people want to cut out the Old Testament, like tear their Bible in half, let's throw away, whoops, throw away the Old Testament. <laughs> but you see, the entire Word of God is for our learning and for our understanding, is what it says in 2 Timothy. The Old Testament holds many foundations of our faith that are not to be neglected. And this is a problem. If we remove the Old Testament and throw it away, and the next generation never sees the Old Testament, they only see the New Testament, it's not going to make sense. It does not make sense. It has to be viewed at an entirety, the entire Bible. Not that it means you have to memorize every word of the Bible, but there's an understanding and a progression of faith that is contained within the Holy Word of God. So let me give you an example. If you do not understand that God accepted animal sacrifices to cover the sins of man in the Old Testament, then Jesus being called the Lamb of God in the New Testament, 
doesn't even make sense. It would be very confusing. What does that mean? Amen. Or why he even went to the cross. See, you see how there was a progression of faith and God takes us to the next level, right? So we need to look at the Bible as a whole <coughs> and not dissect it and say, well, I'll keep this part of the New Testament. This part of the Old Testament's okay. I'm going to throw away the rest. Oh, that's a fun story about Noah. You know, fun story about Jonah. I'll keep those, but the rest, you know, it's not important. We, we can't do that. The Old Testament was a picture of how a chosen people formed a relationship with a supernatural God. Amen. And that's a powerful thing, and it's probably not an easy thing. So we need to, all of this was written down so that we could have understanding, amen, and not make the same mistakes. That's why it's important to look back at your history. It's not the history of our faith. So... It's a mistake to try to focus and make a doctrine out of one scripture and then disregard the context of the relationship of that scripture to the whole rest of the word of God. It's very easy to say whatever you want if you can focus on one scripture and not look at the context with the rest of the word of God. Amen. This is how we get into doctrinal error. Amen. You know, I remember in Bible college, this is where we learned about the inerrant word of God and that you can't just take things out of context. Um, I remember learning it was not good to come up with the most original interpretation of the Bible that theologians did not agree with. That, that usually meant error, error, like you're off track, okay? You're not trying to come up with the most original interpretation. Now, you, you're looking for God's truth, but, you know, it's not to, it's not like uh, this is where you need to use your creativity and come up with something different. I recall when God gave me the revelation on first fruits. It was back in, two, uh, well, back between 99 and then in 2001, I was studying first fruits in the scripture. And I got concerned because I was seeing something that was not presently being taught. And I'm like, am I off track? Am I, you know, um, specifically that in Genesis 4 with first fruits. Now, I think, I don't know if Chris would always talk about first fruits. I think he's talking just about tithing. But let me give you this, this personal example. In Genesis 4 with Abel and Cain, it's always been taught that Abel's offering was accepted because it was a blood sacrifice. Of, of an animal, and it wasn't the veggies in the garden. Well, God has does not view what we do as something more important than the other. It was not the principle of a blood sacrifice. It was the principle that Abel gave his first, and Cain did not. The principle was about giving God the first and the best. Okay, <coughs> but it had been taught it was about a blood sacrifice. And I was, and then I look at all these other scriptures, and I'm like, oh, okay. So I'm a little concerned. Am I off track? So I take it to those covering me, and then over the next couple of years, there's more that God, when He gives something, He does give it to several. Where where we all started because it's a present truth revelation that was now being released, but it's not just for one person. Others were seeing it too, which was confirming as. A girl in her first year in Bible college had a valid scriptural interpretation, okay? And then God began to prove that to me, confirm it, and we started living the experiences. I wanted to be a doer of the word, as it said in James, and do what God was saying. So I was trying to get first fruits and put God first and live that kind of a first fruit lifestyle. So, but if others had validated it, if, I, if, if my covering and oversight said, no, you're really off base, then I would, would have had to go on with that, you know? So, um, so praise God, it wasn't off track, but in fact, the topic of first fruits and giving first fruits to our heart is from Genesis to Revelation. It is a very big principle 
again, that goes through the whole Bible. So the Word of God, in respect to tithing, the Word of, word of God teaches that the principle of tithing in the New Old Testament and in the New Testament, there is nothing that says that tithing is no longer a God or that it is an offense to God. Okay? The Word of God tells us that animal sacrifices are no longer part of New Testament worship. Okay? The New Testament makes that very clear. So we know that that has changed because now Jesus has come to be a sacrifice for sin and for all man, for all time, for the forgiveness of sin. And we have to be very careful not to just lump everything from the Old Testament into the animal sacrifice category and say, oh, the Old Testament is irrelevant, not for today. That's not true. So the second statement he talks about is the often quoted Bible verse. He says, used in the article, says, used by pastors to scare Christians into tithing. Malachi 3, 8 through 10. So I know some of you are laughing. So before I get into that, which I'm like, are you serious? That's what, so let me, let me say this. In this article, and I don't know if Creflo was making the, the emphasis or if it's the writer of this article, that many times the accusing pastors of wanting to steer people in tactics of manipulation and fear in I have a problem with that because even when I preach, I try not to generalize and assume the heart conditions of everybody else out there. So there's several times where it's brought up in the article that he's assuming that everybody knows this isn't true and that it's a fear tactic used by pastors. And I don't agree with that. I don't, I don't, I'm not using I don't believe the scriptures are manipulative. And I don't but I believe that tithing is the word of God. So yeah. yes. So I I'm kind of concerned for him that he's several times saying that he knows the hearts of all the other pastors and leaders out there and that everybody's wrong and manipulative and and I don't think that's a good position to stand on. We have to be very careful not to judge other people's hearts. Only God knows. And maybe some are. I'm not saying they're all right. But I'm not saying he can't possibly know if everybody's wrong at the same time. And well, that's, a, that's a place of concern. Scripture says, do not touch my anointed. Uh, Cheryl was saying, that the scripture says, touch not my anointed. Yes. So I believe if he wants to say this is just you, that's fine. But don't assume what everybody else is thinking and teaching and the motives of their hearts. So, um, so let me read Malachi 3, 8 and 10 for you. And this says, will a man rob God? Question mark. Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. This is God speaking. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, so that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now wherein, herein, herewith, herewith, said the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall be not enough room to receive it. Amen. We got a, a score back there. Amen. Okay. It's got the, what do you call that? The field goal sign? Yes. So I was kind of shocked that this was a scripture that he was coming up against. Um, because this is God speaking to his covenant people. Okay. And God is saying how he is grieved that they have not been walking in covenant with him in tithing and giving in the tithing and the offerings which also includes the first fruit is also one of those offerings the context is very interesting here and this is what i've always noticed about this third chapter of malachi god is speaking here in the third chapter of malachi there's only four chapters 
in this very last book of the Old Testament, after God gives his grievances with his people saying, you're not doing this, you're not doing that, this is, I mean, this is a serious conversation that God is saying, right? One more chapter, book closes, silence for 400 years. I've always seen that as a very serious conversation that God says, I ain't going to talk to you for a while. <laughs> I'm going to send my son to straighten y'all out. <laughs> Just my, my perspective. <laughs> so it seems to me like it's a very, it's always struck me when I've studied this, as I've studied First Fruits and Tithing, this is a very serious conversation, very serious chapter, and then it's followed by four centuries of silence. It's interesting that these verses are spoken by God himself. So when I'm talking with Bishop, he says, Bishop is saying, this is actually not, so Creflo says he's accusing the preachers of fear tactics using this verse. Bishop <coughs> says, if Creflo's using this to accuse the church leaders using this scripture to cause fear and manipulation, He's actually accusing God himself of fear and manipulation. Amen. But it's not its not about fear and manipulation. God's words is just talking to his people about what pleases him and what doesn't and how they had missed it. And God, if, if you were off track, wouldn't you want to know, hey, tell me what I need to do? I would anyway. Yes, you know, I would want to please just straighten me out and tell me how I can get back on the right he was telling his people how to get back on the right track. And he says, and if you do get back on the right track, I'm going to open up the windows of heaven and pour you out blessing that you cannot contain. It's not about, um, do you understand what I'm saying? He says there is a curse, but if you want to be under the blessing, this is what you need to do. Now, so, so when Bishop said that, I'm like, oh, this is a serious accusation. He's making against God. All we're doing is repeating the foundation of tithing in what God has said himself. What more powerful words can you have than God's words, right? These are not our words. We're not making up a scripture. We're not making up examples. We're saying what God has said. So I'm a little concerned about Creflo making that accusation after against God and not, not so much the ministers. Um, God was simply giving his perspective, saying, if you're not in partnership with me, but you say that you are, then you're actually stealing from me. You know? God gives us his perspective in the scriptures, and I believe that this is something serious to, to think about. Amen? <clears throat> so... Malachi 3 actually speaks of the covenant promises from God's heart to those who follow his principles of tithing and giving and what is the key that we put our trust in him. If you're not putting your trust in him, well, then you're not going to want to tithe. Amen. He says that he'll open up the windows of heaven for those that covenant and partner with him with the tithes, the offerings, which includes first fruits. That he says he'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there's no room. No, I keep thinking about that example that there was a the guy that got the new Cadillac and he brought a minister over. He said, I want to show you what this looks like, what Malachi Street looks like. And it's um, an old, an old single car garage that was too small to hold the new Cadillac that somebody had given him. It stuck out. He couldn't close the door. <laughs> the blessing was too big to contain, <laughs> literally. <laughs> it's hard for me to think about that without thinking about this, the end of this Cadillac with the fins, you know, sticking out of this little garage. So, Apostle Leon, he also added, he said in the same chapter, in actually in verse 6, okay, just a couple of scriptures up, Malachi 3, 6 says, For I am the Lord, and I change not. God has not changed his mind. 
And it says, so we finish, and the Amplified says this, For I am the Lord, I, I am the Lord, I do not change, but remain faithful to my covenant with you. And then he goes on to say, about, I have this little grievance against you, which I believe is a big, big grievance that you've been withholding from me. If you're my partner, you've not been truthful. You're not doing what we said we were going to do to move forward. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Do you mind if I give a little uh, modern interpretation there? The little. Uh... So God has not changed his mind about tithing or giving in regards to his covenant. So he says, I'm the same. I don't change my mind. This is the grievance. And then silence for 400 years. And then Jesus comes. And we're going to talk about what Jesus has to say. Okay. Um, so the Lord is the same today, yesterday, and in the future. And the Lord is very distinctive about this point in Malachi 3. Okay. Before I go on to um, the next scripture, um, which is 2 Corinthians 9, 7. I want to give you just a few, a few points to summarize what Bishop and CI are, are saying. And also just to let you know, they're going to be putting out a statement this week. Um, Apostle Tom Hamden, who's the pastor of the church and also Bishop, so when that comes this week, we can be forward <coughs> that email to you. Um, so I just want to point out what Bishop was saying, that his position in the Christian International is that tithing is scriptural, it's valid, God is the same and does not change. He has not changed his mind about this. The Old Testament reveals to us the blessings and the pitfalls of a covenant people who walk with God. So from this, we're to understand the, the things that please God and how we're to be in proper relationship with him. The Old Testament is re, is reveal, has revealed that tithing and giving offerings of first fruits and alms are all principles and part of being in covenant with God. And nowhere does the Bible indicate that God has changed his mind about these divine principles of covenant. Okay? So, let me go back to one more point. It's the scripture that he's kind of basing this on, uh, Creflo cites 2 Corinthians 9, 7. Let each one give, and then this is the amplified version, thoughtfully and with purpose. Just as he has decided in his heart, not grudgingly and not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver and delights in the one who one whose heart is in his gift. Okay, so this scripture is dealing with the attitude of the giver. Okay? Mm -hmm. And what he was saying is, Talk about not giving under compulsion that that ministers are giving doing fear tactics and we're making people give under compulsion and therefore you should not tithe. That tithing is not what we're to do. But this says this this is, it also it says not grudgingly or under compulsion. It's almost somebody can also make a case. It's not just ten percent. It could be more than ten percent. So there's a lot of different ways that this can, you can miss, miss it. I think the real um, important part of this, it's about the attitude that we give him, the word to give with a cheerful heart. So not to give under compulsion where somebody's telling you, you know, that you have to give to feel guilty about it. We should feel to give generously unto God and to give to him when i give i try i try to give with a thankful heart not like oh i could really use that this week you know but i have to do this that's not the heart that god wants us to give it with but it's in appreciation lord thank you 
that you have covered me, you've been faithful, your mercies have been every day, you sustain me. And usually I can find miracles or different things that God has done during that week or that day that definitely showed me that I'm in partnership with a supernatural God. Amen? Amen. So our hearts should be cheerful when we give. It's important to give, uh, recounting God's faithfulness, mercy, and generosity toward us as we give, not grudgingly and not giving under compulsion, but with the desire to give to God in order to be in partnership with God in our daily lives. This scripture does not say, I'm going to use double negatives, so forgive me if you're an English teacher and I'm mixed here. Uh, that's okay. Does not say not to give. <laughs> so my double negative. But it describes the attitude of the heart that in which we should give. Bishop Hammond says that as we're under grace in the new covenant, that the level is even higher than that of the law. <clears throat> and, and this is what he pointed out that I thought was interesting. <clears throat> Under the law, you're not allowed to murder a person or to covet somebody's wife, okay? But Jesus taught that not only could you not murder, but if you hate somebody, it's like murder. And if you even look at a, another man's wife with a covetous heart, it's like already the act of coveting her. Amen. So, and that these are sin. So our life under grace is at a higher standard than even the law was. But the grace gives us the power to overcome the sin. That's what the grace is for. Not to say everything else is exempt and doesn't matter anymore. So in the same way, the scripture above regarding tithing can also speak that it's not limited to the 10% if we're not giving grudgingly. You know, um, but so it can be, and, and maybe that's where he's going to go next with it. I don't know. But um, let's also not forget Matthew 23, 23. And this is what um, Jesus says in the New Testament. And Bishop was talking about this. I didn't catch what the scripture address was. But then sure enough, uh, Pastor, Pastor David Taylor he called me and said, oh, by the way, you might want to consider Matthew 23, 23. Ah, oh, yeah, that's the one Bishop was talking about. And, and this, is, this is what it is. And it's, this is Jesus speaking, okay? He says, woe to you, self-righteous scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites. For you give the tenth or the tithe of your mint and dill and cumin, focusing on the minor matters, <clears throat> And have neglected the weightier, the more important, moral and spiritual matters, the provisions of the law, and justice, and mercy, and faithfulness. But these, he says, are the primary things you ought to have done without neglecting the others. In other words, do these, but without neglecting the tithing. He wasn't saying the tithing was no longer needed. He was saying... Have grace and mercy and faithfulness and also time. So Jesus, if yes, no, here. If this was no longer relevant, Jesus' opportunity would have been right there, but he doesn't. He endorses the tithing as you should be doing this as well as these other things. So so therefore, like I was saying, in conclusion, Bishop says that. He and Christian International, their position is that tithing is scriptural, it's valid, and God has not changed his mind. I, be I believe it's so important about, it's one of the a primary principle, not the only principle, but a primary principle of being in covenant with God. Yes, Jesus did not come to do away with it, but to fulfill it. But again, this is not even a law. It's a principle. It was with Abraham and not with the Mosaic law, with Moses. And if any of you have any more questions or want to discuss this further, I'd be happy to talk with you after church about it as well. So, praise God. So with that... Um, I, I believe that 